The Korean War is often remembered for being forgotten, sandwiched between World War II and the Vietnam War. But the deadly Cold War conflict was immensely important, and plenty of strange things happened. Here are some of the weirdest things that happened during the Korean War. Of all the major players in the Forgotten War, Donald Nichols might be the one America tried hardest to forget. His knack for languages and complete lack of conscience helped him gain favor with South Korean strongman Syngman Rhee. He uh, attended torture sessions. He attended mass killings. There I were found, beheadings. I found a photograph of him standing next to a severed head. Cold and calculating, he would make himself indispensable to U.S. and South Korean forces during the war. Thanks to a North Korean defector with stolen military codebooks, Nichols had the means to decipher enemy communications and foil their operations. Rather than sharing that crucial info with intelligence agencies, he formed his own group of codebreakers, forcing the U.S. and South Korea to rely on him. Because of how important he was, Nichols literally got away with murder. When subordinates disagreed with him, he shoved them out of airplanes and off of boats. He even had a shootout with his own agents. After the war, the U.S. military got sick of Nichols and had him placed in a straitjacket and subjected to months of electroshock therapy. If you need to patch up bullet holes in sub-zero temperatures, Tootsie Rolls are a godsend. Thanks to a ridiculous but fortuitous mix-up, Marines discovered that wacky fact amid the bitterest battle of the Korean War. As history detailed, in the early months of the war, North Korean forces were so overwhelmed that General Douglas MacArthur predicted the whole thing would be wrapped up by Christmas. Then, Chinese troops unexpectedly entered the fray at North Korea's Chosen Reservoir, a region loathingly dubbed Frozen Chosen by the Marines. Instead of crushing North Korean communists, the Marines found themselves cornered by 100,000 Chinese combatants in a mountainous region where temperatures reached as low as minus 25 degrees. So they embarked on a 70-mile retreat. Bullet wounds froze in the perilous cold, and ice-cold corpses were used as sandbags. As ammunition dwindled, the troops requested an airdrop of 60-millimeter mortar ammo, which Marines referred to by the codename Tootsie Rolls. However, the radio operator mistakenly called in an urgent order for the chocolate candy of the same name. The Marines found out they could melt Tootsie Rolls in their mouths and form a kind of putty that would seal bullet hole-ridden equipment as it froze. That MacGyver-like ingenuity allowed them to accomplish their mission and take out several Chinese divisions. Before we dig into this, it's important to keep in mind that the term UFO literally just refers to any flying object that an eyewitness didn't recognize. But what counted as a UFO for GIs during the Korean War? As history recounted, in 1951, troops stationed roughly 60 miles north of Seoul described seeing a jack-o'-lantern come wafting down across the mountain. Eyewitnesses claimed the craft could hover and emitted an orange and later blue-green flashing light. Attempts to down it with armor-piercing bullets caused the craft to move unpredictably. Before racing away, it unleashed waves of light that allegedly caused a burning, tingling sensation. Three days later, everyone in the unit was too sick to walk. The men were diagnosed with everyone's favorite wartime illness, dysentery. However, an ex-NASA scientist thought their symptoms were consistent with radiation poisoning. Were the men the victims of a Soviet death ray, as some suggested? Perhaps stress made the troops hallucinate. If so, at least 42 witnesses had an eerily similar delusion. Ceasefire negotiations started in 1951, and as The Atlantic reported, North Korea desperately wanted to look strong. During one session, North Korea's lead negotiator spent two hours and 11 minutes staring at a U.S. vice admiral and silently chain-smoking. Among other tactics, the legs of the admiral's chair were also shortened to make the negotiator appear taller. But all absurdity broke loose when the North Koreans noticed that the UN flag on the conference table was bigger than theirs. Evidently feeling emasculated, North Korea brought out a bigger flag. Then South Korea whipped out an even bigger flag, triggering history's most Freudian conflict. According to The Independent, North and South Korea kept one-upping each other until neither nation's flags fit inside the conference room. Eventually, South Korea erected a 323-foot pole and the North responded with a 525-foot pole, which for a while was the tallest on Earth. 
Following the 1953 ceasefire, America and North Korea maintained a mostly bloodless animosity toward each other. However, in 1976, they verged on all-out war after a disagreement over a tree. Located in the demilitarized zone, the 40-foot poplar blocked a United Nations command observation post from viewing a checkpoint, according to The Atlantic. So, U.S. Army captains attempted to trim the tree. North Korea balked at the idea, and the infamously belligerent lieutenant, Pak Chul, warned, The branches that are cut will be of no use, just as you will be after you die. The captains continued trimming, so Pak commanded 30 North Koreans to kill them, and assailants beat them to death. The U.S. was incensed, and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger suggested attacking a North Korean barracks. President Ford opted for a ginormous show of force dubbed Operation Paul Bunyan. American aircraft carriers entered Korean waters, and North Korea responded by assuming full combat readiness. The ordeal ended with hundreds of heavily armed U.S. and South Korean troops amassing in the DMZ to oversee the tree trimming, while heavily armed North Koreans watched. During the 1960s, the demilitarized zone wasn't living up to its name. As the BBC described, the not-so-demilitarized zone was strewn with landmines, and battles between North and South Korean forces were commonplace. U.S. Army Sergeant Charles Jenkins was assigned to help keep the non-existent peace, but his mind was occupied by war, namely the Vietnam War, which he feared was his next destination. By 1965, the DMZ was at its most acrimonious, and Jenkins couldn't cope with his circumstances, fearing that he would cause other soldiers to be killed. In a panic, he crossed into North Korea, which he hoped would send him to the Soviet Union to seek amnesty. North Korea kept Jenkins all to itself, held against his will, he was habitually tortured and also viewed as a useful propaganda tool, even forced to star in North Korean movies. Eventually, he married a Japanese nurse who had been kidnapped by the North Korean government. In 2002, Japan arraigned for her release, and two years later, Jenkins was allowed to leave. After turning himself in to U.S. military police, he was tried for desertion and sentenced to 30 days in prison. Do you think of yourself as a traitor? No. If I was a traitor, I wouldn't have come back. During the Korean War, North Korean dictator Kim Il-sung orchestrated the abduction of an estimated 84,000 South Koreans. As Kim Il-sung longed to make up for the mass exodus that occurred when Japan occupied the Korean Peninsula. After World War II, Japan was ousted, North and South Korea were formed, and the newly formed rivals competed to see which could establish itself as the legitimate homeland of the Korean people. After the 1953 armistice, North Korea continued its forced repopulation project, primarily abducting South Korean fishermen. This went on for decades, and Reuters reported that South Korea scarcely acknowledged the kidnappings for fear of angering its ornery northern neighbor. Between 1977 and 1983, North Korea also kidnapped somewhere between 20 and 100 Japanese citizens, often hauling them away from their homeland in sacks. Prisoners were forced to train North Koreans to pass as foreigners for espionage operations, or to conduct spy missions themselves. U.S. Sergeant Jenkins, who we mentioned earlier, claimed North Korea had a spy breeding program that involved having prisoners produce interracial children with Koreans. Admitting fault makes people feel weak and embarrassed, for Scientific American, and apologizing to someone is often seen as yielding control. However, in 1968, America had to swallow its pride and apologize to North Korea. Per NPR, North Korean ships attacked the USS Pueblo, a spy vessel pretending to conduct environmental research near North Korea. One crewman was killed, and the remaining 82 Americans were imprisoned and tortured for 11 months. To save his crew from execution, Lieutenant Commander Pete Booker confessed to espionage. In addition to Booker's declaration, North Korea demanded an apology from the U.S. government. It was a diplomatic pickle for President Johnson, who had tried and failed to intimidate North Korea into releasing the crewmen, who found some interesting ways to rebel. The Americans told the North Koreans, naive about American culture, that they would show the Hawaiian good luck sign. What they really did was raise the middle finger. However, the Vietnam War was intensifying, and it was better to have wounded pride than more wounded soldiers. 
So an American negotiator signed an apology letter while verbally denying its validity. Nonetheless, North Korea kept the captured ship as a trophy. North Korea's track record of aggressive gestures is long and insane. The scary part is that North Korea possesses an estimated 20 to 60 nuclear weapons. The U.S. has tried to curb the country's nuclear ambitions through sanctions and condemnations, but it might be tough to persuade them after the U.S. destroyed North Korea and threatened it with nukes for decades. Most of the Korean War was fought under President Truman, who atomically bombed Japan during World War II. In 1950, he considered doing the same to North Korea, and according to Air and Space magazine, he almost did. To show he meant business, Truman held a press conference to announce that he'd do anything to win, including nuking the enemy. He even ordered mock atomic bombing runs and authorized a general to use the nuclear option if he saw fit. America instead used hundreds of thousands of tons of explosives, according to Newsweek. And beginning in 1958, the U.S. deployed nuclear weapons in South Korea for 33 years to deter the North, per the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Fearing a U.S. invasion, North Korean leader Kim Il-sung began trying to build nukes in the 1980s. The Korean War had an enormous death toll. As many as 5 million people perished, and the Koreas lost about 10% of their civilian populations, according to history. Until 2000, the official U.S. death toll was listed as 54,246, a number literally etched in granite on the Korean War Veterans Memorial. That figure was entirely too high. We don't mean that morally or philosophically. The actual death toll was 36,516. In other words, the official tally was almost 50% too high for half a century. In a baffling clerical error that apparently went unnoticed, the death toll included fatalities from around the world, per the Washington Post. Excluding the deaths proved controversial, however, as some Korean War veterans felt it devalued the already overlooked sacrifices of those who fought in the Forgotten War. Korean legend has it that the peninsula's first kingdom was founded by a dude named Dangun, whose father was the king of heaven and whose mother was a bear that transformed into a beautiful woman after spending 100 days in a cave avoiding sunlight. South Korean professor Jiung Young hun explained because he establishes a sense of shared origins and cultural oneness that Dengun is a basis for Koreans to feel the necessity for pursuing harmony and unification. That elusive reunion seemed a little more attainable in 2018 when North and South Korea's leaders met and visited the mythical birthplace of Dangun together. The Trojan War is one of the most famous conflicts in human history, but it resides somewhere within the space between fact and fiction. The myth is just as much a part of the tale as the actual history. So keep watching as we dive deep into the truth behind the Trojan War. The story of the Trojan War has been told and retold countless times, most famously by Homer in the Iliad. But its historical authenticity wasn't always accepted as fact. In the 17th century, Blaise Pascal wrote, Homer produced a story which he offered as such and was accepted as such. For no one doubted that Troy and Agamemnon had existed any more than the golden apple. He did not think he was making a history of it, merely an entertainment. But it turns out that there's more truth to Homer's tale than initially thought. In the 19th century, a Prussian businessman named Heinrich Schliemann went to what is now Turkey in an attempt to find the location of the Trojan War. In his excavations, he found numerous archaeological treasures that corresponded to the correct location, if not necessarily the correct time period, of Troy. Modern archaeologists later confirmed that these findings correlated with the existence of a city as well as its destruction. So, despite Homer's embellishments, he knew his history. In Greek mythology, the Trojan War essentially begins with a botched beauty contest. All the Greek gods were attending a wedding, except for Eris, who hadn't been invited. But she still showed up, and when she was turned away, she threw into the crowd of goddesses a golden apple that was addressed to the fairest. Hera, Aphrodite, and Athena all wanted the apple, but when they asked Zeus to mediate, he instead delegated the task to Paris of Troy and told the messenger god Hermes to take the goddesses to him. Hera promised Paris untold wealth and power, Athena promised him untold knowledge, and Aphrodite promised marriage to the most beautiful mortal woman, Helen of Sparta. 
That bribe sealed it, and Paris chose Aphrodite as the recipient of the Golden Apple. Surprisingly enough, the judgment of Paris is only mentioned explicitly once in the Iliad in the final book of the poem. The first nine years of the Trojan War were a constant siege against Troy, but the city walls kept the Achaeans at bay. Few sources talk specifically about the first nine years, preferring instead to focus on the climactic events of the tenth and final year. But during this time, the Trojans defended themselves while the Achaeans sacked the neighboring cities. Among the cities that were sacked were Thebes, where Agamemnon captured a woman named Chryseis, and Lyrnessus, where Achilles captured a woman named Briseis. Agamemnon wanted to keep Chryseis as a prize, but her father, a priest of Apollo, offered Agamemnon a ransom for his daughter. After Agamemnon denied his request, his father prayed to Apollo, who swiftly sent a plague that decimated the Achaean army. Agamemnon then begrudgingly gave up Chryseis, though he decided that if he couldn't find a replacement, he would simply take another woman as his unwilling prize instead. Greatly irritated by Agamemnon's threat, Achilles accused Agamemnon of being shameless. Agamemnon responded in turn by taking Briseis to teach him a lesson in authority and power. This act infuriated Achilles so much that he decided to withdraw himself and his troops entirely from battle. Give me cause and I'll give you war. Can you? Despite this, Achilles was worried that the Achaeans might actually lose against the Trojans. So, when his friend Patroclus asked if he could borrow his armor, Achilles agreed. Initially, Patroclus did remarkably well, but then Apollo once again attacked the Achaean army, shattering Patroclus' spear and breaking the armor off of him. While exposed like this, he was brought to his end by Hector. Enraged at the news of his friend's death, Achilles decided to rejoin the war effort. He immediately sought Hector out for vengeance. Upon meeting Achilles, Hector tried to get him to agree that no matter who won, they would not desecrate the defeated man's body, for this is what his mother warned would occur. But Achilles' rage had given him tunnel vision, and he had no regard for fairness. He promptly slayed Hector and then tied his body to his chariot and pulled it back to the Achaean camp. The Trojans then called upon their allies for support now that their best fighter was dead. But they were no match for Achilles, so the gods decided that enough was enough. At Aphrodite's behest, Apollo guided an arrow shot by Paris directly into Achilles' heel, the only vulnerable part of his body. Aphrodite held a special place for Paris in her heart, and having given him the most beautiful woman in the world, she now gave him the gift of killing the greatest Greek warrior. But Aphrodite decided that also she no longer owed anything to him. So when he went to hell in that night, Aphrodite's spell over her had come to an end, and she no longer felt any desire for him. In the final phase of the war, Odysseus came up with the famous plan of the Trojan horse. The Achaeans made it seem as though they were leaving and sailing off as they left a giant wooden horse behind. But in fact, they hid themselves within the horse and waited for the curious Trojans to bring it into the city walls. They made sure that the warrior Sinon also stayed behind to tell the Trojans that the Achaeans had decided to give up and leave the Trojans a present. The Trojans fell for the ruse. That night, as they celebrated their victory, the Achaeans climbed out of the horse and sacked the city. The Achaeans were cruel in their victory as they pillaged the city and committed sacrilegious acts. Out of all the Trojan heroes, only Aeneas was able to escape while everyone else was killed or enslaved. In response to the Achaeans' horrendous behavior, the gods sent down storms as punishment to destroy their ships. Those who were able to return faced a perilous path ahead, like Odysseus, whose 20-year journey home is famously narrated in Homer's Odyssey. Native American warrior women led their tribes into battle, negotiated peace with the United States, served as diplomats, and more. But they don't get the recognition they rightly deserve. Here are the stories of several of the most famous Native American warrior women. Calesta, a wife of Chief Kamiakin, is most famous for fighting by his side, armed with a stone war club in the Battle of Fort Lakes. But she was also a talented medicine woman in her own right, and someone that many believed had psychic and mystical powers. When Chief Kamiakin was injured in battle, she was able to nurse him back to health using her medical knowledge. Many Native American cultures believe in psychic abilities, but this belief is largely misunderstood. Often, psychic abilities relate to knowledge passed down from person to person or the wisdom that a person holds. While she's often mentioned as one of the most famous warrior women, little is known about Calesta. 
After she died in 1865, Chief Kamiakin returned to his ancestral lands, where he later died in 1877. Kamiakin had five wives, many of them from different tribes. This may have aided their efforts to maintain peace. Pine Leaf, also known as Woman Chief or Fallen Leaf, was born in 1806 to the White Clay Tribe. She was taken as a prisoner by the Crow Tribe in 1816 by a father who had lost his son. It was fairly common for tribal members to adopt children in this way. She was only 10 at the time, but her new family raised her with a warrior's skills. Using her training, she killed two men in her first battle and captured several horses. Accomplishing such a violent victory, she was able to make a name for herself at an early age. Pine Leaf was considered a two-spirit, an individual who embraced both traditional male and female roles. Though she wore female clothing, she pursued male interests almost exclusively, and when she eventually became woman chief, she married four wives. Pine Leaf was eventually killed by the White Clay Tribe, her people by birth, in 1854, but she became a mythical figure, not only as a woman chief, but also as both a warrior and negotiator. During her tenure as chief, she was able to broker peace treaties with surrounding tribes, even though her end was a violent one. Buffalo Calf Road Woman was a Cheyenne warrior who became renowned after the Battle of Rosebud. She's one of the most famous Native American warriors, known for saving her brother during the battle and being the only woman in her tribe to fight in the Battle of Little Bighorn. In fact, some people believe that Buffalo Calf Road Woman may have been instrumental in General George Custer's defeat. The Northern Cheyenne tribe's oral history recounts that Buffalo Calf Road Woman knocked Custer off his horse, leaving him vulnerable. According to a Cheyenne elder, they were to keep silent for 100 summers regarding that fateful day, which has obscured some of the facts. This silence was declared because the tribe feared retribution from the U.S. government. Contemporary accounts of the time not only placed Buffalo Calf Road Woman at the battle, but observed that she was the only woman there armed with a revolver. This is key evidence as several other people who claimed to have killed Custer were not armed with a gun, and the doomed general is believed to have been killed by a bullet. Either way, she was almost definitely instrumental in the battle. Moving Robe Woman was also known as her Eagle Robe or Mary Crawler. As a young adult, she witnessed her brother, One Hawk, fall in battle, and then she saw her father, Crawler, preparing to fight. Upon seeing his bravery, she braided her hair and painted her face red, then mounted a horse and rode directly into the fray. She was one of the women who fought against General George Custer during the Battle of Little Bighorn, and like Buffalo Calf Road Woman, some believe she may have been the one who killed him. One warrior claims to have held Custer's arms as she stabbed him in the back. However, the details are murky to Custer's final moments, and it's unlikely that the truth will ever be revealed. Moving Robe Woman did reportedly kill one of Custer's men, Isaiah Dorman, in revenge for her brother's death. Little is known of what happened to Moving Robe Woman after these historic battles, but she was photographed in her 80s as Mary Crawler in a photo held by the Smithsonian Institution. So, though she may or may not have played a role in any major battles thereafter, she did live a long and proud life. Running Eagle's story is a compelling one, blending historical fact with mysticism. Running Eagle was also known as Brown Weasel Woman, and she was born into the Blackfoot Nation in the 1800s. But she became more interested in what were considered male interests, such as hunting, than female pursuits. She went on hunts for buffalo and once saved her father's life when they were ambushed by enemies. Ultimately, she became a successful hunter and warrior. After seeing her husband killed by a Crow tribe member, she spoke with the son, which told her that she would be a fierce warrior if she never lay with another. The waterfall that she had this vision quest at is now marked as a historical site. Running Eagle did, in fact, become a warrior leader and conducted multiple raids. In one such raid, she was able to capture 600 horses. Eventually, she was killed during a raid on the Flathead Indians. As the story goes, some believe that she was killed when she broke her promise to the sun and slept with a man from her party. During the Bannock War, Sarah Winnemucca served as both scout and messenger. Of the Paiute tribe, she fought for the Native American land rights following the war. When her people were exiled to reservations in which they began to die of diseases, she testified before Congress. She lectured over 300 times about the injustice her people faced. Born sometime around 1844, she grew up and began working as an interpreter for Indian Affairs in 1871. In 1878, she began working as an interpreter and a scout during the Bannock War. In one story, it's reported that she was able to save her father by traveling over 200 miles without sleep. Sarah was most notable for straddling the line between her tribal origins and her work with the United States. She was a peacemaker and desired for both sides to come to an agreement. Unfortunately, this didn't ultimately come to pass. In 1883, she wrote Life Among the Paiutes, Their Wrongs and Claims, but the Paiute tribe was not allowed to return to its land despite congressional legislation. 
to test the road with her husband and eventually join Geronimo's band. She was known for being an aggressive and lethal warrior, but she also worked to translate, negotiate, and mediate. Many Native American warrior women are remembered for being both warriors and diplomats, and Detest was part of this group. In fact, some say that Detest and Lozen, another famous Apache warrior, were in a relationship. While they did fight together and were arrested together, there is little evidence to support the claim that they were in a romantic relationship. However, they were close, and an interviewer noted that Detest mourned Lozen's death until the day she died. Detest, like Lozen, is believed to have been two-spirit. She dressed and fought like a man for much of her life. Detest proved herself on the battlefield, fought side by side with other women, and survived her encounters with the settlers. With the nickname Apache Joan of Arc, it shouldn't come as a surprise that Lozen was known as a feared and fearless leader. She was both a medicine woman and a warrior, and was rumored to have incredible powers. She traveled with both Geronimo and Detest. Before that, she defended her lands with her brother against the U.S. Army. Before battles, the Apache would often pray for guidance. Lozen had the uncanny ability to use these prayer sessions to tell exactly where the enemy might be. Thus, she was known to be an excellent strategist. She also excelled at both riding and shooting. Lozen spent years in skirmishes and raids, eventually falling in with Geronimo until he surrendered in 1885. She was battle sisters with other Apache women, including Detest. After repeatedly coming to blows with the U.S. Army in battle, Lozen was taken prisoner. She died of tuberculosis in Alabama. Alashanks was the chief of the Sacanet people in what is now Rhode Island. Born around 1620 and most active in the 1670s, Alashanks would eventually become one of the signatories of a peace treaty between the local tribes and Plymouth Colony. It's not known what her real name was. Alashanks was a granted title that meant she who is queen. When her husband died in 1660, she became the leader, but it's also believed that she held the position because of her strength and wisdom. She would eventually marry two husbands and have three children. Alashanks participated in King Philip's War, which is when she appears most frequently in records. She initially supported Metacomet's fight against the British colonizers, but then switched sides in a deal to protect her people from retribution and enslavement. The deal worked at first, but eventually her people were ultimately displaced, as were many other tribes, and some were enslaved as well. A tribal leader of the Navajo Nation, Annie Dodge Wanaka, was a different type of warrior. In 1951, she became the second woman ever elected to the tribal council. She spent her time on weekly radio broadcasts in the Navajo Nation about medical techniques such as vaccination. She eventually became the first Native American to get the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Wanaka was born in 1910 to the cliff-dwelling people of the Navajo tribe. She started her medical administrations at the age of eight after surviving the flu. She then married and studied health, becoming an activist for the Navajo Nation. In 1918, the Spanish flu tore through the United States. The disease wreaked havoc throughout the already suffering Native American community. Thus, Wanaka's calling became to help the indigenous people learn more about health and public safety. Nanahi, or she who walks among the spirits, was a Cherokee woman born in 1738. Nanahi was influenced by her uncle, a Cherokee chief, to believe that the only way Native Americans would survive contact with the settlers was to coexist with them. She wanted to find ways to make peace between the people. When her husband was killed in a battle against Creek Nation, Nanahi took up his rifle and fought until they were victorious, earning herself the title of Beloved Woman. She would go on to be named the head of the Woman's Council and given a place in the Cherokee General Council. She was the first woman to be given that honor, which led to one of her descendants, songwriter Becky Hobbs, to write a musical about her. She's not only remembered as an iconic historical figure with the Cherokee people, but she's also a pioneer for women in American history. Nanahi would eventually marry an Englishman and take his name, consequently taking the name Nancy Ward. She would continue to try her best to prevent violence between the Cherokee tribe and the settlers, once saving a woman from being burned alive and bringing her to her own home. Toward the end of her life, Nanahi began to believe that the settlers would continue to take more and more land and pleaded with her people not to give up any more of it. But her protests were fruitless and much of her native land was sold. She died in 1822, living a peaceful life as an innkeeper. Toiparina was only 25 when she inspired a revolt against the Spanish in 1785. Though many denied their role in the rebellion, Toiparina proudly admitted hers. She famously said to them, quote, of course I did it. A medicine woman of her tribe, Torpirina had become defiant after witnessing Spanish brutality against the natives. At the time, 5,000 of her people lived in what is now the San Gabriel Valley in California. 
Many of the Tongva were left without land as the Spanish took over much of the resources within the area. Further, many of the native Tongva were converted into the Spanish faith. Now called Gabrielinos, they were seen as enemies by some. Those who were not converted felt these new worshippers disrupted the Tongva's native way of life. Torparina took it upon herself to ally eight Tongva villages against the Spanish. They intended to kill the leaders, but they were betrayed and captured. Seventeen of them were whipped in public as a warning. Torparina, along with other leaders, was held for questioning. She was eventually imprisoned for a year and a half. Today, a 60-foot mural honors her memory and bravery. When it comes to weapons, war is unsurprisingly the mother of invention. The need to gain an upper hand has led to plenty of advances in combat over the centuries, and some of them have been rather strange. Here are some of the most bizarre weapons ever used by soldiers in war. By the early 20th century, chainmail's heyday had long passed. This archaic armor was no match for machine guns, tanks, and bombs, but it nevertheless found its unexpected last hurrah in the trenches among British tank crews. During World War I, tanks rolled through enemy lines and cleared out areas for infantry advances. Their heavy exterior armor protected them and made them difficult to destroy, but they weren't invulnerable. Drivers still faced the repeated impact of machine gun fire, shells, and grenades in their poorly ventilated compartments. As shells and bullets repeatedly pounded tank exteriors, crews suffered flurries of hot metal shrapnel that could burn their faces. So the British improvised a special mask to protect their tank crews. This mask protected the eyes and left slits for visibility, and the lower half of the mask was chainmail. It was meant to capture shrapnel in its rings and protect the mouth and chin of the tank crewmen. That sounds ingenious, although it's unclear how well it actually worked. The lasso is a simple piece of rope with a loop at the end that conjures nostalgic images of the Old West. Back in the ancient world, it doubled as a cheap and deadly weapon. On the Eurasian steppe, metal was scarce. The nomadic inhabitants relied on armor and weapons made from a mix of wood, hide, and horn. Metal weapons were more frequently found among the aristocracies of steppe societies, so common warriors had to make do with weapons like bows. Others preferred the lasso. According to the Greek travel writer Pausanias, the Iranian Sarmatians were masters with the lasso. A favorite tactic of these master riders was to charge an opponent and lasso him off his horse. The Sarmatian warrior would then drag his opponent back to his lines, assuming he survived the initial fall. Lassos appear throughout the Iranian-speaking steppe world and were immortalized in the Iranian epic poem The Shahnameh, in which legendary warrior Rostam defeats his opponent by lassoing him and pulling him off his horse. Although medieval warfare was plenty bloody, the goal wasn't always to kill enemies. When it came to higher-ranking foes, it was sometimes lucrative to capture them instead. But capturing an enemy wasn't always easy. To solve this problem, someone devised a terrifying-looking weapon called the Man-Catcher. This device consisted of a metal pole with a claw of sorts at its end. The tips were spiked, allowing it to dig into an armored enemy enough to immobilize him but not excessively harm him. If used correctly, the wielder could snatch a foe off his horse and drag him back for ransom, assuming he survived. Although the man-catcher disappeared from the battlefields as gunpowder took over, evidence suggests that law enforcement kept using it in Europe to capture criminals without killing them. Versions of it are still used today in some countries for riot control and non-lethal restraint. In 1544, English King Henry VIII received an offer from an Italian man named Giovanni Battista di Ravenna, who proposed that Henry arm his gunners with gun shields. The idea behind this strange weapon made sense, but its execution was lacking. Henry gave permission to have his bodyguard experiment with the weapon before trying it out on the battlefield. The idea was to place a shield with a hole in it through which a firearm could be inserted. The gunner would thereby be protected from enemy fire while still being able to see and shoot his enemies through a grill in the shield at eye level. Although Batista's idea was theoretically well thought out, there was one major problem as the shield was too heavy and made it impossible for the gunner to fire his weapon. Oh, this is heavy. The only way to fire the gun was to place the shield on a stand or some other support. Thus, it was easier to fire the gun unprotected without the shield. The idea was abandoned for infantrymen, although it was possibly repurposed for ships where gunners could use the deck for support. During the 15th century, a firebrand preacher named Jan Hoes spoke out against the Roman Catholic Church. After his execution for heresy in 1415, his followers, known as Hussites, spread throughout the modern Czech Republic. In 1419, they rose in revolt against the Holy Roman Empire. From 1419 to 1436, Crusaders and Hussites fought across Bohemia. 
Although the Hussites were outnumbered and under-equipped, they devised an ingenious wagon-based weapon to negate the Imperial Army's most powerful arm, its knights. Wagons had been used in war since ancient times. So while the Hussite use of wagons wasn't new, their bizarre-looking modifications made them virtually impregnable. Under Jan Zischka, the old commander of the Bohemian Royal Guard, the Hussites developed the Wagenberg. Zischka reinforced the wagons with wood panels on all sides, and each wagon became a mobile fort filled with gunners, slingers, crossbowmen, and pikemen. The Hussite wagon fort was devastatingly effective, and it defeated five crusader armies. This tactic was so successful that it spread to Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and eventually all the way to India. Eventually, though, heavier, more powerful field artillery would negate the advantage of the war wagon. But during its time, this simple yet ingenious weapon ruled the battlefields of Eastern Europe. A dead man cannot fight, but during the Middle Ages, deceased soldiers sometimes proved more useful than living ones. During this time, it was generally understood that plague could spread from person to person, even if the causes weren't fully yet understood. In 1346, the inhabitants of the Genoese city of Kappa discovered to their horror how an infected man could fight even in death. Bring out your dead! Bring out your dead! At the time, Kaffa was a bustling merchant city, though its Catholic majority often clashed with its Muslim neighbors, who were subject to the Mongol Golden Horde. After one dispute led to violence, the Golden Horde laid siege to the city in 1346. With naval dominance in the Black Sea, Genoa could reinforce and resupply the city by sea. Meanwhile, the Black Death had spread via the Silk Road into southern Russia. The pestilence stuck the besiegers, killing many and forcing them to abandon the siege. Before leaving, the furious Mongol commander sent the defenders one last grisly souvenir. As the Tatars dismantled the siege lines, they loaded dead bodies of their own men onto catapults and flung them over the walls. Many of Kaffa's inhabitants fled the city, hoping to escape the plague, but in doing so, they inadvertently brought it first to Constantinople and Anatolia, and then eventually to Italy. This unconventional warfare on the Mongols' part accelerated the spread of the plague, which ravaged Kaffa and killed over a quarter of Europe's population, a fitting revenge. Following the conquest of eastern Poland in 1939, the Soviet Union attacked Finland. The Finnish army fought back in a brutal conflict called the Winter War, as a country of four million people attempted to preserve its liberty against communism. Despite being outnumbered and outgunned, the Finns would not be easily bowed. The Finns' main problem was their lack of anti-tank guns. To compensate, they transformed crude Spanish petrol bombs into a sort of sticky grenade dubbed the Finnish Molotov Cocktail. Because petrol bombs often endangered the thrower as well as the target, the Finnish army completely revamped the weapon. The bottle was filled with a mix of tar, kerosene, and potassium chlorate, making for a sticky, highly flammable mixture. The bottle was then sealed tightly to prevent leakage. Ingeniously, they were lit with two matches on the sides. A soldier could safely light the matches and throw the bottle, ensuring that if it broke, it would light up its target. Fire! 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 The finished Molotov cocktail proved effective against Soviet tanks. It could ignite the tank and smoke out the crew, whom Finnish riflemen could then pick off at leisure. A bottle in the hatch would burn the crew alive, while a bottle to the treads would immobilize the tank. The tar ensured that the liquid stuck to clothes and skin, making an encounter with a Finnish Molotov cocktail a guaranteed death sentence for Soviet tank crews. In 1942, Germans pioneered moderately successful remote-controlled mini-tanks to fend off Allied tanks and blast through enemy fortifications. This mini-tank was called the Goliath, a misnomer considering that it was small enough to slip underneath a full-size tank while carrying up to 220 pounds of ordnance. This made it useful not just against enemy tanks, but also against pillboxes, gun emplacements, and other field fortifications. The Goliath was the latest in a string of experiments involving remote-controlled explosive delivery systems. It was controlled with a joystick that was hooked to the Goliath with an unwinding cable. This made the Goliath useless if the cable was cut. However, the amount of explosives made it extremely potent if it reached its intended target, and Goliaths were used to devastating effect during the Warsaw Uprising in World War II. Although the Goliath's problems led to its eventual abandonment, its principal contribution was in the field of robotics. British, Israeli, and American scientists all built on the principles behind the Goliath, as they created remote-controlled mine-clearing and bomb-disposing vehicles. While attempting to neutralize Germany's legendary Panzer Corps during World War II, the Soviets tried a highly unorthodox solution. 
It turned out to be a miserable failure and would today be considered animal abuse. But during Operation Barbarossa, the Soviet commanders created kamikaze dogs. They strapped the animals with roughly 26 pounds of TNT inside two pouches carried on their sides. They were trained to crawl underneath German panzers. Once they reached the underside of their targets, a spring mechanism would pull the pin on the explosives and detonate both the tank and the dog. The Soviets encountered a major problem with this weapon in addition to the animal cruelty. Often, the dogs simply refused to run toward the Germans, or worse, they would run toward their own lines and create havoc among the Soviet vehicles. Since the German tanks smelled unfamiliar due to their gas engines, the dogs were more comfortable near the more familiar Soviet diesel-powered tanks that they were trained with. This program was shelved after one year, but the use of animals to ferry explosives did not die. As recently as 2014, Israeli forces shot a suicide donkey bomber near a border crossing. Russia's defeat in the Crimean War exposed the country's technological backwardness, prompting Tsar Alexander III to begin modernizing the Navy. With the advent of ironclad monitors in the United States and Europe, Russia risked falling behind its global rivals. In response, they experimented with a new design, a circular ship. At the time, a Scottish engineer named John Elder had been delving into creating floating fortresses. Following Elder's lead, Russian sailor and engineer Andrei Popov decided to make the circular ship a reality. Popov and Elder noted that a circular ship would displace more water and allow a greater number of guns to be deployed on the vessel's deck. As an added advantage, much of the hull would be underwater, making it difficult to hit from the deck of another ship. So in 1873, the Russian Navy put the Novgorod to sea. Unfortunately for Popov, the Novgorod had been approved without testing. Because the ship was so oddly shaped, the rudder and propellers were too small to move it, and the vessel was unstable when unmoored even in calm waters. Ultimately, the Novgorod was only utilized briefly during the Russo-Turkish War in 1877. It was assigned to coastal defense afterward and eventually scuppered in 1903 as dreadnoughts and other steel steamers came to rule the seas. Fears of a nuclear apocalypse led governments towards some weird and morally suspect ideas during the Cold War. They ran the gamut of things most people associate with the era, like radiation, espionage, and strange experiments. Keep watching for some truly messed up things that happened during the Cold War. You probably know about the nuclear bombs that hit Japan at the end of World War II, but there's more to this story. In addition to the two nuclear cores and the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a third core was also prepared, but Japan surrendered before it could be used. So instead, it was turned into a tool for Manhattan Project researchers interested in high-risk radiation experiments. In August 1945, physicist Harry Daglian went into the lab alone and surrounded the core with tungsten carbide bricks, meant to reflect neutrons back to the core, pushing it closer to criticality. He accidentally dropped one of the bricks onto the core, which went critical, bathing him in the blue light of a deadly reaction. And this wasn't an isolated incident. In May 1946, Canadian physicist Louis Slotin was running a similar test, almost completely shielding the core with a pair of beryllium half-spheres, which he kept apart with just a screwdriver. The screwdriver slipped and the core went critical. Both Daglin and Slotin died of radiation poisoning. The core was dubbed the Demon Core, and criticality experiments were no longer conducted hands-on at Los Alamos National Laboratory. As reported by The New Yorker, in the 50s and 60s, American military doctor Jim Ketchum believed that chemicals like LSD and BZ were a humane alternative to guns and bullets. But the military couldn't just start using these weapons. They had to test them out first, and their methods played fast and loose with morality. Army personnel would consent to taking part in these experiments, but they were never told that they involved drugs. They might get sprayed in the face with a liquid that they thought was water but was actually LSD. Or they might get stuck in an experiment called The Longest Weekend, a three-day test in which four volunteers were dosed with varying levels of BZ and locked inside a room, where they had to complete so-called missions. One soldier was given a placebo, two were given a more moderate dose, and the fourth was high to the point of incapacitation. The reason for the secrecy was that the researchers didn't want the volunteers' knowledge of being high to affect how they would act while drugged, which doesn't exactly do much to assuage concerns about morality. In the wake of World War II, radiation was a major concern. Understanding the long-term effects of radiation exposure was understandably important, but that importance hardly justifies some of the things that researchers did, in particular testing the effects of radiation on unwitting subjects with injections of radioactive elements. Researchers would find hospital patients with bleak diagnoses and inject them with highly dangerous amounts of plutonium. These injections were kept completely separate from medical records and done without the patients knowing what the injections really were. 
The point of the research was to see how the body would hold on to or secrete the radioactive element, and it doesn't end there. The doses given to these patients were sometimes five times the maximum limit that the body might be able to handle and were given while knowing that plutonium would be absorbed by bones and kept there for years. So not only did researchers know that these injections wouldn't be helpful, they also had a pretty good idea just how harmful they would be. Wait a minute, are you, are you telling me that this sucker is nuclear? A number of different studies involving radiation were carried out during the Cold War and ethics were unfortunately often a secondary concern. For example, as reported by the Associated Press, researchers in the 1940s at a free clinic at Vanderbilt University gave iron pills to over 750 pregnant women to study how their bodies absorbed the iron. The Alliance for Human Research Protection has similar information, stating that 820 pregnant women were given iron as part of a cocktail drink. The problem was that these pills contained radioactive iron, which was reportedly intended as a tracer for absorption mechanisms. It's also likely that none of these women actually knew what was in these pills or that they were part of an experiment. Furthermore, the records were destroyed in the 1970s, which would naturally arouse suspicion. Studies in the 60s indicate that a handful of these women's babies died young as a result of various cancers. Initially, these results were written off as insignificant, but later investigations concluded that it was probably because of exposure to radiation. After all, when compared to a group of unexposed women, there weren't any similar cases. In the 50s and 60s, the CIA was legitimately concerned about mind control and decided to become masters of it themselves. The point of this operation, known as MKUltra, was to find a way to essentially break the human psyche and then replace a person's consciousness with whatever the CIA wanted. MKUltra's experimental techniques included the likes of electroshock treatments, extreme temperatures, isolation, general psychological torture, and plenty of drugs. Some people volunteered to be a part of the research, but not everyone, like prisoners whom the researchers figured were expendable. In general, most people didn't really know what they were signing up for. Mob boss Whitey Bulger, who was incarcerated at the time, thought he was part of a study to cure schizophrenia. But what really happened was that he was dosed with LSD every day for more than a year. He wrote about his experiences as he described hallucinations like people turning into skeletons and blood dripping from the walls. To top it all off, the project even hired Nazi doctors for their expertise, and then most of the records were destroyed. In 1955 in San Francisco, there was a nice, unassuming house furnished with a French theme, but it was actually a CIA safe house. 225 Chestnut Street was the main location for Operation Midnight Climax, one of the most bizarre experiments of Project MKUltra. The CIA had hoped to use LSD as a truth serum while combining that with their findings that subjects were more likely to give up secrets shortly after physical intimacy. CIA agents paid female sex workers to lure unwitting subjects back to the safe house where they would be dosed with LSD. From behind a two-way mirror, the agents could watch what happened next. A second safe house was set up in Marin County, and it became the CIA's playground for all sorts of different substances and delivery methods. George White, the head of the operation, loved the voyeuristic aspect of it all, as he reportedly later asked, where else could a red-blooded American boy lie, kill, cheat, steal, rape, and pillage with the sanction and blessing of the all-highest? During the Cold War, the Soviets got really creative with poison. Back in 1921, they created an entire facility dedicated to perfecting poisons, called variously the Special Room, Laboratory No. 1, Lab X, Laboratory No. 12, and the Chimera, it had a particular goal in mind, discovering poisons that were odorless, tasteless, and invisible to autopsies. In chasing that goal, the lab came up with some pretty scary stuff, like a gaseous form of cyanide, as well as poisons that made the cause of death appear to be a heart attack. A bunch of people fell prey to these poisons, including potential spies, dissidents, and political enemies. And that's not even counting the unfortunate test subjects, who were typically political prisoners. Unsurprisingly, everything was covered up and kept secret. It was so secretive that even Mikhail Gorbachev was denied a briefing in 1988. And as The Guardian reported in 2018, there was even speculation that the program was still going, functioning the same way it did decades ago. There was a time when the United States wanted to nuke the moon. That might sound like the plot of a bad sci-fi movie, but sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. Sputnik was the immediate cause behind this absolutely ridiculous sounding plan. When the satellite was successfully launched in 1957, it appeared for all intents and purposes that the Soviets had taken the lead in the space race. In comparison, the United States feared was feared to be looking puny. 
For American officials, that was disastrous. They needed something big and flashy, something utterly ridiculous, just to prove to the rest of the world that the United States was still the mightier superpower. And that led to the question, is it possible to launch a hydrogen bomb at the moon? And would it create a mushroom cloud visible to everyone on Earth? Research into this idea really was conducted, leading to the answer that it was entirely possible to hit the moon with a hydrogen bomb. Obviously, though the American government didn't go through with it, it was determined that because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere like Earth's, there wouldn't really be a big mushroom cloud. Instead, debris would fly up but not back down, thus no distinct mushroom shape. Furthermore, people on Earth would probably just see the flash of an explosion, which would have been way less exciting than intended. Also, for publicity stunt prospects aside, people weren't exactly on board with bombing a place that humans might want to, and eventually would, visit in the not-too-distant future. Considering the paranoia and constant fear over nuclear warfare during the Cold War, it really shouldn't be surprising that this era saw the development of some absolutely insane weapon ideas. Project Pluto was one of those ideas. The plans detail a new kind of nuclear missile that would have been powered by a nuclear reactor. It would take in the air, heat it up, and use that expanded air to propel itself. The so-called SLAM missile could fly for long stretches of time, all while being easily maneuverable before reaching its target and detonating the warhead that it carried. The cruise missile was also uniquely devastating. The nuclear reactor that it used to propel itself wasn't actually shielded by anything, as concrete would have made it too heavy to fly. Thus, all the radiation the reactor created would just be released into the air, raining down on whatever the missile flew over. And that wasn't all. The supersonic missile was so loud that designers thought that anyone it passed over would be killed by the shockwave alone. Basically, the Project Pluto missile would have been a flying death machine, spewing radiation and shattering windows everywhere it passed. Aside from the horrifying image the missile presented, it was impossible to test, as it couldn't be flown over friendly territory at all. Ultimately, it was abandoned in 1964. If you've ever heard of the Geneva Conventions, perhaps you've also heard of biological warfare being outlawed in the 1920s. But that didn't end research into it. Anthrax, cholera, and botulinum toxin could easily be devastating, so during World War II, the United States sponsored research into these weapons. Post-war, there were tests on civilian populations during the 50s and 60s. Agents would carry briefcases or light bulbs into airports or subways, releasing bacterial agents into the air to track how bacteria might travel through a population. The Pentagon itself was even a test location. One notable test was carried out in San Francisco in 1950. Two types of bacteria were sprayed into the air of San Francisco Bay over the course of about a week. The city's inhabitants were breathing in millions of these bacteria every day, and at least one person died, potentially from the tests. The researchers believed that the bacteria they used was harmless, although later reports unsurprisingly disputed this. More than 200 of these tests were conducted, and the affected civilian populations had no say in what was happening, nor any idea that they were being used as guinea pigs. And even when the government was confronted with the San Francisco experiment, they managed to shirk responsibility for any damage, as they claimed they didn't need the public's permission to carry out these tests. In 1932, the Emu War was declared in Australia. Farmers and soldiers alike battled it out with one of Australia's native flightless birds. A few months later, the Emus were declared the victors. Here's the messed up history of Australia's Emu War. During World War I, Australian state governments introduced soldier settlement schemes to provide returning veterans with a source of income. Approximately 9 million hectares of land were given to returning veterans, creating around 23,000 farms across Australia. This was all part of the Return Soldier Settlement Act, which was introduced in New South Wales in 1916. The act stated that soldiers who had been honorably discharged could apply for crown lands if they had served overseas. Various districts specialized in particular industries. In Tasmania, soldiers worked as dairy farmers. In Queensland, they formed cane. And in South Australia and New South Wales, fruit industries were established. By definition, crown lands are lands that were taken from Aboriginal people during the colonization of Australia. Over the course of the war, many Aboriginal men served in the Australian Imperial Force. When they returned to Australia, many of their applications for soldier settlement allocations were denied for no apparent reason other than their indigenous heritage. There were a handful of successful applications, but those who were successful were all fair-skinned enough to be considered substantially European. The land that the soldiers were given often wasn't suitable for farming. While soldiers could get advances on money for equipment and seeds, most learned the hard way that they weren't cut out to be farmers. Ultimately, the land they received did not sustain them and their families. The Wheat Belt was established in southwestern Australia. Roughly 5,000 soldiers settled in the area, but by the 1920s, almost one-third had given up. 
farmers were forced to diversify their crops in order to sustain themselves. As the 1929 Great Depression led all commodity prices to drop worldwide, the newly elected Prime Minister James Scullin proposed a plan to aid Australian farmers. Scullin told Australian farmers that if they produced more wheat, he'd ensure the passage of the Wheat Marketing Bill. This was in order to guarantee farmers a minimum price for their following year's crop. Unfortunately, the proposed price guarantee disappeared as a direct result of political wrangling. By September 1931, the government had abandoned its plan to compensate farmers for their losses, and as a result, farmers were only able to sell their wheat for less than half of what they'd been expecting. Many called it one of the greatest disasters in Australian economic history. It took four tries to pass a relief bill. By the time it finally passed in 1931, the damage had already been done. Prime Minister Scullin's Labour Party lost the elections that year. When Joseph Lyons became Prime Minister, he cancelled the relief bill. After suffering two disastrous years in 1930 and 1931, wheat farmers decided to withhold their wheat until they were able to get a fair price for it. Around the same time the Australian government was giving plots of land to veterans, Western Australia changed the status of emus from endangered to vermin. This was largely because the land given to farmers was being invaded by emus searching for water. Although emus typically migrate from the northeast to the southwest in the spring, they are unpredictable in the speed and distance they travel. The number of birds traveling in a group also varies a great deal. When the Australian government declared emus to be vermin in 1922, they also instituted a bounty for them paying for emu beaks. The emus were a huge problem for the farmers since they ate the crops, but they also made large holes in the fences surrounding the farms. The fences were essential for protecting the farmers' crops from rabbits, an invasive species that had been brought by English settlers so they could have familiar hunting targets. Emus, meanwhile, are indigenous to Australia. A flightless bird that can stand over six feet tall, they're opportunistic grazers and will eat anything from grass to nuts. So as they pass the wheat fields on their migratory path, who could blame them for enjoying the buffet? In 1932, as farmers were withholding their wheat, they were also forced to contend with a massive group of emus. The emus came along in their migratory path in the fall, and as roughly 20,000 emus descended the Campion district, farmers tried to fight against them themselves. By 1932, the 20,000 birds were wreaking havoc on the wheat farms of the veterans. Even those men trained soldiers who killed thousands of emus could not control them. At one point, some boys reportedly killed as many as 27 emus in a single day. They accomplished this feat by riding around on bicycles and swatting the birds in the head with sticks. A similar endeavor was attempted with a truck, but the truck's engine was too loud and scared the birds away. The farmers panicked because not only did they need the harvest to make money, but they also needed it as leverage against the government. After a while, the emus started catching on to what was going on, so despite continuing to eat the farmers' crops, they also became wary of humans and wouldn't allow them to get close. Because the farmers didn't trust the Ministry of Agriculture, they instead turned to the Minister of Defense for help. Representatives for the soldiers-turned-farmers reached out to Sir George Pierce, the Minister of Defense. One account states that a letter was written to Sir Pierce, while other accounts claim that the farmers sent a group to see Sir Pierce personally. Either way, they reached out to Sir Pierce specifically to request machine guns to combat the emus. Sir Pierce was intrigued by the plan and discussed it with the Commandant of the 5th Military District, A.M. Martin. Together, they decided that it would be a useful training exercise for their soldiers. Sir Pierce also decided to send a Fox Movie Tone cinematographer along. He recognized an opportunity when he saw it. He wanted to show the rest of the country how hard the government was working to better the lives of all Australians during the Great Depression. The local Society for the Prevention of Cruelty was reportedly consulted as well. They approved the idea as long as their inspectors could verify that the animals were treated humanely. Additionally, Colonel Hode of the Australian Light Horse found out about the project. He insisted on making an order for 1,000 feathered emu skins in order to use their plumage for his horsemen's hats. Sir Pierce decided that machine guns would be provided as long as they were operated by professional soldiers who knew how to use them. On top of that, the farmers would have to provide all of the ammunition, food, and lodging for the soldiers. The operation was initially planned for early October 1932. Two machine gunners, Sergeant S. McMurray and Gunner J. O'Halloran, were assigned to the mission. They were each given two Lewis Light machine guns. Along with Major G. P. W. Meredith and the Fox Movie Tone cameraman, they headed to the Campion District. The Farmers' Agricultural Bank agreed to front the government for the ammunition. It would be repaid out of the farmers' future profits, so the men bought 10,000 rounds of ammo with the advance. The group arrived ready to decimate the emus, but the rain arrived just as they did. As a result, the emus scattered for a month. Per their agreement, the farmers housed the men in the town of Perth. When the rain finally ceased and the emus returned, the soldiers headed once again to the Campion district. 
On their way, they saw a group of 40 to 50 emus, and Major Meredith decided that it was time to start culling. The first shots were fired on November 2, 1932. Several soldiers sought to gun down a group of emus. The soldiers also rallied around 50 local farmers to help herd the birds with their trucks toward the machine gun. However, emus don't stampede in a straight line. Instead, they scatter in all directions when startled. When the cars roared toward the emus, the birds split into small groups and bolted in every direction. Plus, emus can run up to 40 miles an hour, which can make it even more difficult to focus on a target. The emu stayed beyond the range of the machine guns, coming no closer than a thousand yards. And although Sergeant McMurray fired at the emus, all of the shots missed. The soldiers asked the locals to try herding the birds once more. The birds managed to remain out of range, but this time Sergeant McMurray was able to gun down six of the emus. First blood of the emu war was shed. The next day, the soldiers managed to kill nine emus, but not before the birds devastated a farm. Two days later, the soldiers ambushed a group of a thousand emus. Since they had waited quietly for the emus to approach them, the birds were hit at point-blank range. Between 10 and 12 emus fell. However, the machine gun jammed and the emus scattered. The emus quickly figured out that the machine guns had a limited range, so a majority of the birds escaped confrontations. One plan involved putting a machine gun on the back of a truck, but not a single emu was killed. Not even a single bullet was fired because the gunner had problems hanging on. The only casualty was a stretch of fence that was destroyed when the truck crashed into it. By November 8th, out of the 10,000 rounds of ammunition brought from the mission, 2,500 had been fired, but there were only 200 dead birds to show for it. In an ironic twist, when the emus ran to avoid the soldiers, even more farmland was destroyed by their powerful stampeding legs. Sir Pierce hadn't involved his superiors in the emu war, so when Prime Minister Lyons was asked about it, he didn't know what to say. The operation turned into an embarrassment, and the soldiers were ordered to withdraw from the Campion district, effectively calling a ceasefire. Major Meredith, Sergeant McMurray, and Gunner O'Halloran complied with their orders, but the farmers pleaded for their return. Sir Pierce was able to finagle a bureaucratic loophole that allowed the Western Australian state government to borrow the machine guns and the soldiers. So Major Meredith mounted a second campaign on November 13th, although that day they only managed to kill 40 emus. A month later, reports claimed that 100 emus were being killed each week. However, Meredith calculated that they were using 10 bullets for every emu they killed. As a result, on December 10th, the soldiers were ordered to withdraw once more, bringing the emu war to a close. Although there were no casualties on the human side, by the end of the war, fewer than 1,000 emus had been killed. In his final report, Major Meredith offered an unusual total. 986 birds that were killed using 9,860 rounds of ammunition. He also claimed that 2,500 more had died from wounds, though he didn't indicate how he determined that number. It's estimated that the Emo War had one of the worst bullet-to-kill ratios in military history. After the war, much of the public was on the side of the emus. They were disgusted by the images of the slaughter. News of the Emo War even reached Great Britain, where animal conservationists protested the war and decried the slaughter of a rare bird. The Agricultural Board tried to get the farmers to reimburse them for the cost of ammunition. The farmers claimed that they were owed money since they were the ones slaughtering the birds wounded by the machine guns. Although the Emu War was declared over by the soldiers with the Emus as the victors, farmers found themselves in the same position they'd started in. They again asked the government for assistance in 1934, 1943, and 1948. But this time, the military decided not to get involved. The farmers were told that using machine guns was out of the question. The government decided that the least they could do was provide ammunition so that the farmers could address the problem themselves. Over the course of six months in 1934 alone, over 57,000 emus were killed. Between 1945 and 1960, over 284,000 bounties were claimed. Western Australia continued to pay bounties for emus until 1999, when emus came under the protection of federal legislation. In the end, the only thing that drove the emus away was scarcity. When the wheat was gone, the emus moved on. In the 1970s, farmers decided to start farming emus instead of fighting them, and the first farmed emus were created. It began with capturing wild emus and, ironically, feeding them primarily wheat. By the 1990s, emu farming had caught on in all of the Australian states. By the mid-1990s, over 60,000 emus were being farmed in Australia. With the birds' protected status, the emu population in Australia is estimated to be at least 600,000, and they've been classified as being of least concern. However, wild populations of emus remain at risk of local extinction due to encroaching human activity. In the end, ornithologist D.L. Servanty summarized the emu war the best with this very tongue-in-cheek quote, 
The machine gunner's dreams of point-blank fire into serried masses of emus were soon dissipated. The emu command had evidently ordered guerrilla tactics, and its unwieldy army soon split up into innumerable small units that made use of the military equipment uneconomic. A crestfallen field force therefore withdrew from the combat area after about a month. The deadliest civil war in human history, the Taiping Rebellion, broke out in the middle of the 19th century. What started as a small sect of violent Christians quickly transformed into a rampaging army of more than two million. And buddy, things got bloody. In 1814, history's deadliest religious leader was born. Hong Shikuan inspired the Taipings to rebel and plunge China into years of chaos. But Hong wasn't born an arch manipulator. Instead, he had the fortune to be born in a society all but ready for a spectacular collapse. 1814 China was ruled by the Qing Dynasty. Although they'd initially been dynamic rulers, their society had become rigid and dogmatic. There'd been no infrastructure improvements to China for 100 years, even as the population tripled. On top of that, the strict Confucian Code sorted people into classes they couldn't escape. This resulted in a society people trapped in miserable poverty with no hope of bettering themselves. Things were even worse for the Hakka class, of which Hong Shi Kuang was a member. A group of internal migrants who fled the Mongol invasions back in the 13th century, the Hakka were still treated as outsiders and were ready to rebel against their Qing overlords. Many sources deride the Taiping as vulgar outsiders. Such sources were just as likely, however, to criticize the dynasty for its atrocities and destruction. Although most people were stuck in their particular societal class, an exit did exist. The imperial exam could be taken by almost anyone, and passing it meant not just money for you, but for your entire village but test takers rarely passed. The imperial exam was almost a religion in Hong's time, a way to bring both honor and money to your entire village. But it was also widely hated. There are contemporary poems about men driving themselves mad trying to pass. Still, people kept on trying, including people like Hong Shi Kuang. Hong's community recognized from an early age that he was extremely intelligent. They banded together to pay for his tuition and basically bet their life savings on this one child passing the test. It exerted tremendous pressure on the young boy's mind and laid the groundwork for his future actions. By 1837, Hong had taken the exam three times, and each time he failed, and the young man did not take failure lightly. After the third exam, Hong was confined to bed, during which time he was racked with visions. According to accounts, he went into the sky and met a great man with a long beard who told him to slay all the demons on earth. He is also said to have met with a middle-aged man who instructed Hong in martial arts. By the time Hong awoke, days had passed. Five years later, Hong had just failed the imperial exam for the fourth time when a cousin gave him a pamphlet on Christianity. Reading it, Hong realized the old man in his vision had been God and the middle-aged man was Jesus. Hong also realized that he was Jesus' Chinese brother, put on earth to exterminate all demons, starting with the Qing. Right after Hong started dreaming about Jesus, something happened that would break the last bonds holding his nation together, the First Opium War. British merchants, mainly the East India Company, annoyed that China wouldn't buy their goods, had begun smuggling opium into the Middle Kingdom. When the Qing found out, they confiscated and burned the opium. In retaliation, the British annexed as much territory as they could. The First Opium War was a drawn-out conflict that resulted in the British repeatedly defeating the Chinese. The Royal Navy devastated the Qing, seriously damaging their prestige. Eventually, the war came to an end, with China decidedly the losing side. Aside from netting Hong Kong, the British won the right to flood the nation with opium, making the addiction crisis even worse. But there was another side effect to the Opium War. The 1842 peace treaty made it easier for Protestant missionaries to enter the nation. Suddenly, a whole bunch of Chinese peasants were aware of Christianity in a way they'd never been before. Despite the influx of Christianity, most people ignored Hong's preaching, but his teachings did find a solid audience among his fellow Hakka. His people formed a militia loyal to Hong known as the God Worshippers. By 1850, Hong was preaching a message of economic opportunity that resonated with Imperial China's poor and downtrodden. Inside this message was a not-so-secret call to arms. Hong offered free land to potential followers and a kind of proto-communism to live under, both of which involved overthrowing the Qing. Eventually, the ruling class realized this and sent soldiers to deal with the god worshippers. When the Qing armies faced the militia, the trained soldiers completely fell apart. Amazed, Hong and his rebels decided to press their advantage. They fought all the way up the Yangtze River, gathering more followers until some two million were marching behind Hong. In 1853, this gigantic army reached the former imperial capital of Nanjing and overran it. From a Hakka nobody, Hong was suddenly in charge of southern China. Once in Nanjing, Hong declared the creation of the Heavenly Kingdom of Great Peace, which was built on Christian principles. However, his actual policy was much more violent and punitive. 
You could be beheaded for singing raunchy songs, for smoking opium, for, quote, casting amorous glances, and for having lustful thoughts. But Hong went even further. He made it an offense for even married couples to have sex. All of this while Hong sat on his own solid gold throne. Conscripts had the name of the Taiping regime forcibly tattooed on their faces. At the same time, the New Kingdom engaged in some truly bizarre behavior. Hong and his lieutenants would decide state policy in religious trances, then have their proclamations issued as poems that gangs of women were forced to memorize and sing in public. But even this weirdness couldn't hide the Taiping's brutality. Public torture and executions were part of daily life in the heavenly capital. One king who displeased Hong had his entire extended family butchered and his head paraded around on a pole. Despite the horrible acts and corrupt rule of Hong's kingdom, Western society did nothing to help and certainly didn't make the situation better. In the U.S., the Christian nature of the Heavenly Kingdom, despite its heretical belief that Hong Shi Kuang was actually related to Jesus, became a cause to support. The book Autumn in the Heavenly Kingdom describes how American Christians began agitating for their government to support the Taipings, with the New York Times even writing editorials on Hong's favor. Over in Europe, it was less the Christianity and more the radical nature of Taiping society that people warmed to. Karl Marx and the continent's hardline liberals all saw Hong's devotion to land rights and economic equality as the very thing they'd been agitating for for decades. Even the British, who relied on a stable China to keep buying their opium, basically shrugged their shoulders. Had things turned out differently, it's possible the Taipings might have become recognized as China's legitimate rulers. Unfortunately, the former rulers of China, the Qing, were in no position to fight off Hong's people. With remarkably bad timing, the Second Opium War kicked off in 1856 while the Taipings were still rampaging across southern China. The Imperial Army found itself going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hong's army and with France and Great Britain. The Second Opium War was even more nakedly self-serving than the first. Seeing the Qing tied up fighting the deadliest civil war in human history, London used the conflict as an opportunity to seize more land in China. The murder of a French priest convinced Paris to join the fray, leading to another great European carve-up of Chinese territory. The Second Opium War ended in 1860 after killing tens of thousands and hobbling China just when it needed all its resources to take on the Taipings. The ink had barely dried on the treaty ending the Second Opium War when the U.S. began marching toward its own civil conflict in April 1861. And that's important to the history of the Taiping Rebellion because the U.S. Civil War had the small side effect of crashing Britain's cotton market. In the 19th century, Northern England had placed itself firmly at the center of a textile trade that started in the Deep South's cotton plantations and ended with the Chinese buying British cloth. As the book Autumn in the Heavenly Kingdom shows, the Taiping Rebellion badly dented that market. When the U.S. Civil War also exploded, London was suddenly faced with significant civil disorder in Britain's now penniless northern cities. Not wanting a rebellion of their own, the British were left with two options, interfere in the U.S. Civil War or interfere in China. After briefly flirting with the idea of getting involved with the Confederacy, the British instead decided to intervene in China. By the early 1860s, the Qing were through with the rules of war. They resorted to fighting using the same nasty strategies as the Taiping rebels. The Qing approach was twofold. First, Beijing allowed warlords to raise massive armies provided they used them to fight the Taipings. These armies were as efficient and as brutal as warlords tend to be. The second approach was to use British warfare techniques to systematically exterminate the Taipings. The Qing set up vast sieges of cities across all 18 provinces with a Taiping presence, cutting them off so effectively and for so long that the inhabitants were forced to resort to cannibalism. But that was just the start. Once the starved city surrendered, the Qing mass executed everyone inside. The most notorious massacre was at Anqing. After a two-year siege, the Taipings surrendered only for the Qing to chop the heads off every single man inside the walls. The women, about 10,000 in all, were carried off as prizes. 600 cities were completely annihilated over the course of the war. By 1864, the Qing had chased the Taipings all the way back into their capital and laid siege to Nanjing. When the city finally fell, it would be the end of Hong and his heavenly kingdom, and both the Qing and the Taipings knew it. It might explain why the eventual conquest of Nanjing was so unbelievably bloody. Hong Shiquan himself died in the middle stages of the siege, possibly after eating some poisonous berries, maybe believing they were manna from God. But the real horrors came when the Qing finally breached the city walls. Over the next three days, they effectively razed Nanjing to the ground. By the time the dust had settled, it's thought that 100,000 people had been killed. The Taipings didn't go quietly. Groups of fanatical true believers gathered in the last hours of the city and set themselves on fire rather than be captured. Men, women, and children all died in the inferno. It's entirely possible that this was history's deadliest battle before World War I. 
By way of comparison, 7,058 soldiers were killed at Gettysburg. Although pockets of resistance would keep fighting for another two years, the fall of Nanjing and the death of Hong effectively ended the Taiping Rebellion. The Qing regained control of China, and the Middle Kingdom enjoyed its last decades of stability before the 20th century changed everything again. Today, this mostly forgotten civil war is generally estimated to have killed between 20 and 30 million people. To put that in perspective, that's up to 30 times the number killed in the U.S. Civil War. World War I, a war fought with machine guns, heavy artillery tanks, and poison gas, killed only around 20 million. And these are just the generally accepted estimates. At the higher end, 70 million people may have died in the Taiping Rebellion. Were a war to kill 70 million people today, it'd almost be 1% of the entire global population. In the world of 1860, with a population at roughly 1.2 billion, it was over 5%. The Taiping Rebellion is a huge, huge war. I mean, one of the, the biggest, most violent civil war in human history. And the deaths didn't stop there. The book Autumn in the Heavenly Kingdom argues that Chairman Mao's communist revolution was made possible by the failure of the Taipings. The result was the Chinese Civil War and one of the deadliest dictatorships in history. Hong Xiquang may have died in 1864, but his memory killed millions over a century later. 